Hi, thanks for clicking on this video. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and we hope you enjoy this message. I get some believers that say, neighbor, I don't know what you come to do, but I know that God created me to cover the earth with my worship. So that's what I'm going to do. Come on, clap your hands and give him glory. You can have your seats. I've already started preaching. My text was Psalms 34, 1 through 8, if you want to go home and read that. <clears throat> we are in this series called We Outside. And uh, I want to thank God for Pastor DJ, my boo thing, my husband. Uh, he threw me out here again, praise the Lord. But I'm grateful and honored that the Lord has um, allowed me to stand here before his people. Um, I want to thank God just for the words that he's been just kind of ministering to my spirit for the past two months. And um, I was pondering and pondering all week. And I'm like, Lord, that's what you gave me. But is that what you get? Is that what you want for your people? And some of it he, he's allowing me to share with you guys on today. And so my title, I've already given you the scripture. My title is um, on today is cover the earth with your worship. 90% of what we call worship is preoccupation with the end result. Uh, what is our end result is the reason why we worship. <laughs> so if we really think about it, some of us look at worship or treat worship like most rich people have antique cars treat their antique cars. How many of you ever been or seen an antique car show? Come on down to Old Bridge, honey. They have it every Sunday almost. Amen. How do they care? How they care for their antique cars is how some of us treat worship. They purchase them for thousands or millions of dollars only to sit in their garages is to show off when people come by their homes or to pull them out for that every weekend or every summer uh, car show. Amen. And so if you ever talk to them and ask them, how often do you drive this car? And they'll tell you, oh, I don't drive this car. Now, they have a car that's worth millions of dollars, but they don't drive it. I mean, it's immaculate. You can eat off the engine. It's so clean. But they don't ever drive the car. And that's what some of us do with worship. We come to church. We, we put on our face. And Pastor talked about all of this. We put on our clothes, and we look appropriate. Amen? Amen. We thank God. Y'all ain't got to say nothing to me. I come in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. But we put on our faces, we put on our clothes, and we look appropriate. We think about what God can do for us first, right? We thank God for the first time in the, in the whole week. Today is the first day we said thank you. And so when we get here on Sunday mornings, we, we, we shine ourselves up like we shine up our cars or shine up our shoes to display for when people come by to see us. Do you think the maker or the manufacturers that made all of those antique cars that millions of people have just to sit up in their garages to be cute and pretty like trophies? No. What is the purpose of the car? The purpose of the car is to what? Drive them. Uh -huh. there's, there's the church. They made them to be driven. So they spend hours cleaning and waxing their cars that we don't use. So the means of having the nice car or the means of being a worshiper looks good at the end. 
They love the end result of the car be a night being a nice clean and sparkling car and so many of us love the look of certain titles right I just like to be on stage I just like to be on the spotlight I want to be the most important ministry leader in the church and when these focuses are your goal then your purpose is being abandoned you are no longer walking or, work or working in your purpose. When your song becomes more important than what you're, who you're singing to, then the entire worship encounter is aborted. The process should always take us to where? Purpose. But the process should never become the process itself. And so many of us have become worshipers of the process. This isn't an easy thing to do, not to do. Have you ever heard someone say, well, I did my job. I showed up. I worked the camera. I ushered at the door. I sung my song and I prayed for the people. We are not concerned about whether God showed up or not. We are more concerned about what? The process. And so when we make the means or the end our ultimate goal, the thoughts of being in the spotlight, we then make it an idol. And so we worship the thought of being up here more than worshiping God. We worship the thought of being seen. I don't want nobody to see me. I don't want to be noticed more than we worship God. And so this means you have no means in fulfilling the purpose of God. Just in case you're wondering, what is she talking about today? I'm talking about the purpose for why you were created on earth. Somebody repeat after me and say worth-ship. Worth-ship. Whatever is worth more to you, that's what you will worship. Even if it's a dance, even if it's a song, a guitar, a drum, your song, your prayer, your title, whatever your thing is. That's why I said you think it's very simple, but it's difficult when you don't have your purpose together. And so most times when we come into the house of God to worship, most of us who come week after week don't really understand the purpose of worship. And so the most cited definition of the word worship, let me help you this morning, is based on the etymology of the English word worship. Uh, that word worship is derived from the old English word worship. So when we worship God, we are proclaiming or giving back to his worth. Are y'all with me? God's worth is infinite, so we can never, ever give him back enough. Worship is more than a song. I'm here to tell you this morning that worship is a lifestyle. Prayer is a time where God can get to, an, get to have an exchange with us. But worship is what we give back to God. And so we express how much he means to us when it comes down to worship. It basically means catching a glimpse of a reality of the creator and then responding to that glimpse. It's like a kiss in the middle of a response to the love of God. Y'all know how y'all do y'all booze, right? You're looking at them, they're smelling good, they're looking good, and they're just talking, and you all just mesmerized, and you just, mwah, out of the blue, kiss them. And they like, that's what worship is. You're thinking in the presence of God, God, I thank you. Oh, I heard that song, your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. You sure was, God. I almost fell this week, but your goodness was running. Come on, somebody should have remembered. Did you get a glimpse of his goodness? And was your response a kiss back to him saying, God, I thank you? For running after me. Somebody say, God, I thank you for running after me. The author Rick Warren wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. We were with the Intentional Tribe on Monday night talking about this book. He quoted in that book, and I quote, one of the common biggest mistakes that Christians make is that we seek after an experience rather than purely seeking after God. 
And so worship is not an experience. Let me help you this morning. It is not an event. It is not a weekend service. Look at your neighbor and say, it is a lifestyle. Look at your other neighbor and say, did you hear what she said? It is a lifestyle. Worship has always and always will be about God. Worship clearly identifies which kingdom you belong to. God has always desired truthful worship. Let's look at Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5, verse 21. I'm going to read it from the message version. and Y'all know the hood version. It says, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences and your conventions. I want nothing to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick and tired of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image making. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you sang to me? Do you know what I want? I want justice. And he didn't just say justice. He said, I want justice. Oceans of it. I want fairness. Rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. Here the word is talking about having the look, and the noise, and the sound, but not having God in the midst of our worship. Worship has and still is all about God and not us. Worship has always required truth and integrity. Our need to worship is inbuilt, right? It's a part of our DNA. It's the ultimate expression that our existence craves. If we don't worship our Lord, we end up being involved in things of adultery which is simply placing our affections on anything else higher than our God. So worship and the, and, the, and the worship of God has always been about the importance of our God. True worships come out of the saving grace of God. Somebody say, God, I thank you for your saving grace. It's the kind of God that leads us to repentance. True worship will lead you to repentance. I said true worship will lead you to repentance. And then the revelation of the power of the cross. We should always find ourselves at the cross. In true worship, if you see a cross, if you see the cross, then it should bring you to what? Repentance. And so we start to think on the cross and we really meditate on the kindness of God. Our response should always be worship. The story of Abraham and Isaac is a great example of worship. He gave his very best sacrifice, which was his son. The Bible said he rose early to be obedient. Some of us don't want to wake up early, Brother Adolphus. The Bible said he woke up early to be obedient to the word of the Lord. Just before he goes to sacrifice his son, the angel came and said, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. God himself has seen that you won't hold back anything. Can I help about 10 people in this room that will get up early and as you go and make that sacrifice of your last hour, your last 30 minutes of sleep, the Lord told me to tell you today, because of your sacrifice... Because he knows that you won't hold back anything, he's not going to hold back on you. Ah, uh, LaDerek, they don't know how to respond. I say, you can tell who's making sacrifices because they know how to respond to the sacrifice that you have already made. He didn't hold back anything when he went to sacrifice his only son, the one child he waited most for all of his life. He went to get up early and sacrifice that thing that he'd been waiting on all his life. Can I help some of you? The thing that you've been waiting on, you are you willing to make sacrifice for it to show up earlier? He said he was waiting all his life. Are you willing to wait out the process while you're making sacrifices? Or are you waiting on the shiny object before you say thank you? 
He didn't hold back anything. So this morning, I want to challenge you to never hold back your worship. Every opportunity, every chance you get, you ought to lift up your voice in your bed, in your bathroom, before you put your legs to walking out your door. You have ought to take a moment to give God worthship. And so in this series that we are in, Pastor G.J. spoke about the revolution worshiper. And that thing shook everything inside of me. Anybody who knows me outside of the church, I love all things women and building up women. I have over 20 years of experience in it. And one of the things I always teach them is to start a revolution about them. Come on, a revolutionary worshiper, Pastor DJ says, one that is worshiping from a place called now. You see, we are living in the past. We're, we're living in the things that we've lost, but God is in the future. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to catch up. And so when we think about change, most times this is what we think about, a revolution, right? If you would look closely, you would see, Pastor DJ told us that the woman left the well, left the pot, as well as anything that represented what? A temporary satisfaction. Not talking about this mountain or this mountain, but her proclamation was, come see about a man. She was breaking all of the rules. Revolution means to change something it means a sudden a radical or complete change y'all don't hear me today it means a forcible overthrow of a government of a government or social order in favor of a new system can I help you today God wants to tear down what the enemy has planted in your mind that you cannot change he said if you overthrow it if you overthrow it, if you forcibly overthrow the bad systems, the bad mindset, the thing that told you that you're not worthy of lifting your hands, the voice that told you that you don't deserve goodness and mercy, the thing that lied to you and told that you, that you weren't blessed, he said overthrow it. And so when you reach revolutionary worship, more than the place has changed, the mindset has changed. And once you have had presented your undivided heart to him, the change in your desires, Pastor DJ said, reflected not only in simply a feeling, but a mindset change. I believe she reached a place called revolutionary worship. Somebody say it with me, revolutionary worship. It was worship that changed everything. It was worship that reclaims divided hearts. It was worship that changes and renews mindset. And be not conformed, the Bible says, to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Revolution is something that is disruptive. And it removes a system that does not work to a place called reformation worship. A place of change reform back to God's original tent. Somebody said we got to not only get to revelational, revelationary worship, but we got to get to a place of reformation. That means going back to the original intent for worship. And so reformation don't just involve the destruction of things, the tearing down of things. It doesn't just challenge things. It means it's taking away a system and bring it back to the original system. It's taking away one system, but it's bringing you back to the original system. Any iPhone users in here? Any apostolics? Oh, y'all ain't acting like y'all proud. Apostolics? Any apostolics in the room? Listen, every now and then, you get a little message that says you need an update. Your, your stuff was glitching a little bit. And it's trying to tell you, I need you to update this so it can get back to the original intent. So it can get back to what I created it to do. I need somebody to say, my lifestyle should be back to where... God originally designed it to be. 
I want you to let's take a look at the Bible again. Reformation means that we should bring it back to its original state. It also means to purge a place of purity. And so why we do that? Because anything that is designed by God or has the nature of God must be clean and pure. And so I want to take us on a journey through 1 Samuel 21 really quick. 1 Samuel 21, a chapter uh, 21. This was a chapter in the life of David that teaches us a valuable lesson about finding strength in a time of desperation. It also teaches us principles on how not to stop at just revolutionary worship, but live from a place of reformation worship. Y'all ready? And so in this passage, we witness David at one of the lowest points in his life, fleeing from King Saul. And yet, even in the midst of hardship, he shows us how to maintain our faith and seek God guidance. So when 1 Samuel 21, David, who was anointed as the future king of Israel, is on the run, right? Who sought to kill, who Saul sought to kill him because of jealousy, my God. And as he faces this life-threatening situation, there are a few things that I want us to glean from on today. The first verse says, then David went to Nob, the, uh, uh, to Amimelech, the priest. And Amimelech was afraid of meeting David and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? The first thing we should get out of this scripture is David went to seek the presence of God. He went to the priest, although the priest was afraid of him. But David went to the priest. And when David arrives to the city of Nob, he seeks refuge in the house of the Lord. When you come to the the house of the Lord. Don't be afraid to seek refuge. In times of desperation, we should follow his example by seeking God's presence through prayer, through meditation, and seeking wisdom from his word. Somebody say the sanctuary is a place or becomes a place of communion with the almighty God. Let's read on to verse 2. It says, David said to Amimelech the priest, the king has charged me with a matter and has told me, let no man know anything of the mission on which I send you. And with that, I have charged you. I have appointed the young men to a certain place. Can I help you this morning? When you are in the presence of God, there's no need to put on a face. Look at your neighbor and say, be honest with God. David, in his desperation, did not hide his circumstances from the priest Amimelech. Instead, he honestly shares his situation. Similarly, in our times of need, we should be open and honest with our God in times of worship, in times of prayer. Why? Because he already knows our hearts, but our transparency and strength, our connection with him, he knows everything already. And they that worship him, the Bible says must what? Worship him in spirit and in truth. When you're in the presence of God, there's no need to lie. Amen. He sees all and look at your neighbor and say he knows all. And if I could be honest on this morning, the reality is about 85% of this entire room has not fully opened up ourselves yet to the father yet this morning. We have the form, we have the look, but we have not opened up. We are allowing our fears to cause us to hide in the presence of the Lord. We're call, allowing our sins to cause us to hide in the presence of the Lord. When the Bible says they that worship him must worship him, what? In spirit and in truth. Transparency deepens your intimacy with God. When we share our innermost thoughts and our emotions with him, we draw him closer. We allow God to see our hearts as, they, as it truly is. And this vulnerability leads to a deeper, more meaningful relationship. It's something like when you're doing pillow talk with your man or your woman. It's quiet in the room. Y'all know pillow talk. You say everything that's on your heart. We are vulnerable, whether it's our husbands, our wives, right? It doesn't matter. In that place of intimacy, hear me, don't you hide in this moment. 
Don't hide in this moment. God is here to reveal all of it so that you can be transparent with him. And so we must live, all he's saying to us is we must live a life of repentance. If you live a life of repentance, you don't have to walk in shame. I don't care who knows my business. I've already repented, and that's between me and God. When we share our innermost hearts with him, we must live a life of repentance. Be honest about where you are in the presence of the Lord. Repent means to turn away from. Repent means to turn away from your wicked ways to say, so that you can hear from God and have a real God encounter. The next verse 3 says, now what do you have on hand? David asked the priest. What do you have on hand? He said, give me five loaves or whatever you have. And verse 4 says, and the priest answered David, there is no common bread on hand. But there is hollowed bread. If the young men have kept themselves at least from women. My third point for this morning is common bread leads to death. The priest said there is no common bread on hand. But, somebody say but, there is hollow bread. And so in this passage, David seeks food and shelter from the priest Amimelech at the city of Nob. The hallowed bread means, or the consecrated bread mentioned in verse 4, is also known as the bread of presence or the show bread. This was the bread, the special type of bread that was placed in the tabernacle. Y'all remember? Or later, uh, uh, the, the, the later the temple, uh, later in the temple as an offering to God. And so only the priests in this day and time were allowed to eat this bread and it was considered holy. Here's what the passage means. David was desperate, right? David is in a dire situation, fleeing from King Saul, who is seeking to kill him. He and his men are hungry and in need of food, right? He turns to the priest for assistance, hoping to find substance and shelter. I want to ask you this morning, where are you getting your bread from? I'm asking that question because it matters where you eat your bread. Where do you get your fuel? What's fueling you? What's motivating you? What's moving you? What's steering you? Where do you get your strength from? The Bible says that man should not live by what? Bread alone, by, but, but by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of who? That comes from the mouth of who? Jesus met the woman at the well. And he told her, I have water that will cause you to what? Never thirst again. Do you believe that when you came to the well this morning, that Jesus said, I have water that will cause you never to thirst again? Do you believe that? What well are you drinking from? Could it be you are filling up at the wrong place and it's leaving you at a deficit? And so we keep going back to the same old things and we're coming here crying, Lord, why, Lord, why me? But have you considered where have you gotten your bread? What well have you been drinking from? The verse 4 says, and the priest answered, David, there is no common bread on hand, but there is hollowed bread. If the young men has kept themselves at least from women, the priest is asking David, are you and your men clean? I see you lifting your hands. I see you serving on the choir. I see you playing your instruments. I see you serving the media team and even serving the pastor. But are you clean? He said, this is not common bread. 
And that's the problem with how we show up to church every week. We show up approaching God as if he's common. There was nothing common about a holy God. Nothing. Did you read Revelation that said when he showed up, when they were worshiping him and God showed up on his throne, there was thundering and lightning. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, that's not common. There is more, much more of God available than we have ever ever known or ever even imagined but we have become satisfied with where we are and what we have that we don't press for God's best yes God is working in our lives but we've been content with combing the crumbs from the carpet as opposed to having the abundant loaves of bread God has prepared for you in heaven, God is calling, saying, come and dine with me. Going are the days of counting our stale crumbs from yesteryear's bread. People are starving for him, not, stor not stories about him. How many of you want to you wanna experience him? You don't want to just hear about what used to happen. I want a God encounter with him. And that's one of the reasons why people are willing to get to connected to the wrong things. They, they are used to the counterfeits. We're used to counterfeit prophets. We're used to counterfeit intercessors and mentors and all of these things. Why? Because you're used to the counterfeit. You're used to common things. And so when something rare comes, you feel weird, you feel uncomfortable, and then your trust issues, your, 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 your unhealed part of you start showing up. Can I help you? When you're here in worship, the enemy wants you to keep your mouth closed. He knows that he got you. When you show up in shame, he knows that he got you. When you show up and don't say a word. I know we think.